We're going to just continue on in our study in the book of Exodus. We'll be in Exodus chapter 17 tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again just for a time to get together here to uh, just kind of walk through your word. We ask God that you would uh, just speak to us and help us to uh, get direction for the things that so many of us are walking through right now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as we've been going through Exodus, guys, remember we saw the children of Israel placing their faith in the blood of the Lamb, Passover. We saw them bump up against the Red Sea, a certain ending, and all of a sudden the Red Sea parted and they passed on through. We made a quick mention about that, how that's such a picture of placing our faith in Jesus and then being delivered from certain ruin or certain death. When they came through the Red Sea, remember they had that song, the song of Moses, where they sang praising God for his deliverance, and they were so excited, remember. Then we get into chapter 16, or at the end of 15, actually, in verse 22. It says there, 1522, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness. The first time they go in the wilderness, this wilderness of Shur. And we talked about it. So just a way to remember in your mind, whenever we place our faith in Jesus and we're set free from eternal death, we now are a follower of Christ. We go into the wilderness for the first time, if you will, that experience of like, oh, I'm out here now again. It's always the wilderness of Shur. You can be sure there will be a wilderness time in our life. They're in the wilderness there. They come to Marah, remember? They couldn't drink the waters of Marah because the waters were bitter there. And they're complaining. It's the first time we see it in verse 24. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what are we supposed to drink? And we see Moses crying out to the Lord, saying, oh, man, we got a mess here. But he cries out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree that has always been there. But he shows them the tree, remember? They take the tree, Moses takes the tree, puts it in the bitter waters, and the bitter waters become sweet. And we said, oh man, how often is that the case? We're, we're new followers of Christ, and we're loving Jesus. Life is good, and all of a sudden, wilderness experience, that which we thought used to be sweet was now bitter, and we're like, oh man, this isn't what I signed up for and all, and someone points us to the cross. And says, look at the cross in the midst of this. And all of a sudden, that bitter water, in quote, becomes sweet. In chapter 16, we see that they are out now in the wilderness of sin or zin. And while they're there, one month to the day from Passover, verse 2, then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. You have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They're saying we're dying of hunger out here. And that is understandable. I mean, they need food. But they complain again. And they blame Moses and Aaron. And the Lord says, Behold, in verse 4, I will reign. And we, we remember from last week, the last time we saw the Lord saying, We're gonna, I'm going to rain, it was I'm going to rain fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, I'm going to rain. We're going to, uh-oh. He said, I'm going to rain bread from heaven. I'm going to bless these complainers. I'm going to bless these people who are questioning my goodness to them because they're hungry. And we saw them complaining. We see the grace of God again. So with the bitter waters, they're complaining the grace of God. He makes them sweet. They're complaining in the wilderness about being hungry and we're going to die out here in the grace of God. He gives them bread from heaven. And the rest of chapter 16, remember, we saw this manna or this bread from heaven. Now we get to chapter 17, verse 1, and we see it again. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready 
to stone me. So these first four verses, we see this, a similar situation. But notice as we get into chapter 17, it says here, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord. And that is the key issue. They're in this wilderness, but notice what it says. They are according, they are in this wilderness according to the commandment of the Lord. And that is extremely key. Because they're in this wilderness, and what do they find, remember? Well, they find that there is no water for the people to drink. Two million people out in the desert, they're at Rephidim, and there's nothing there. Yet they're walking according to the commandment of the Lord. God knew and directed them to a place without water. God did that. From their perspective, three days in the desert without water, we're all dead. We are out here now. Nice going Moses, you know. So they are not in a good spot right now. And what they do is they blame Moses. Isn't that the easiest thing to do when we're in a hard time, find someone to blame? If you're married, blame your mate. If your kids, blame your parents. I saw that. <laughs> Klesim gives around to the old boy. <laughs> But it's one of those, it's one of those things that uh, kids blame their parents. Employees blame their employers. We're always going to blame somebody in the church. Blame, um, I guess, the media people. I don't know. They blame somebody. <laughs> don't blame the pastor or whatever you do. But you know, blame some, But you know how it is. We're going to blame someone. We're in a problem. We're going to find someone to blame. It certainly wouldn't be us. And we might even blame God vicariously. Eve, did you eat? Or Adam, did you eat of the tree that I told you not to eat? It's the woman that you gave me. God, really, it's you. if you wouldn't have given me the woman, I wouldn't be eating that tree. God, if it's the wife that I have, if you'd give me a better wife, I'd be, I'd be a godly man, you know. That's basically what they're saying. He's what he's saying. And then he looks at Eve. Remember what Eve does? Wasn't me. Devil made me do it. Flip Wilson. <laughs> so there it is. Old people know that. Young people. Uh, but at any rate. But it's it's that it's that same concept. We just got to find someone to blame. I think it's interesting to remember that if we are walking in obedience to the Lord and a trial comes, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And it's important for us to remember that difficult times in our life can happen in times of obedience. Difficult times are not always the result of sin. They can be. They can be consequences of sin. But they can also be a difficult time as we're walking with the Lord. Here we see it. It says in verse 1, They walked, they set out according to the, command, the commandment of the Lord. And there was no water there. They're walking in obedience and there was no water. A difficult time walking in obedience. If we're walking in obedience, every place where our faith is tested is a place that God has led us to. If we're walking in obedience. It's just a time to be tested. No water. You can see why they'd be concerned. They're in the desert. There's no water. They're concerned. The problem is, as we've read, is their response to the issue. They get mad and they attack and blame Moses. And that becomes the issue. They respond to the problem they're in, in the flesh, not in the spirit. In our Monday morning study, there's a group, if you're not there, I want to invite you to come. There's like 10 guys showing up. It's pretty, it's pretty stinking sweet. But we were in the book of James. And take a look, if you would, at, at James chapter 1. You're very familiar, I know, with this passage, but it's interesting because 
as James is writing this, remember this is James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, James, the half-brother of Jesus. He's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, part of the diaspora. So we know he's writing to the Jews who are now followers of Jesus. They're scattered throughout the Roman Empire because of the persecution in Jerusalem for the most part. And he's writing to them, and he says this in verse 2. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In context, you read that and you go, yeah, right. I got a hard time. This is awesome. Okay, I'm just going to count this all joy. This really stinks. I just got fired and we're going to lose our home, lose our car. Man, the dog won't even come wagging his tail to me. We're, we're in trouble. And I'm supposed to count this all joy. But the context, the key to that old passage is the next verse we saw on Monday morning. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all live without reproach, it will be given to him. For years I've taken that out of context and said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, let's ask God for wisdom. The context is, you're in a trial? Ask for wisdom. Amen. God will let you see it from his point of view. And now you get the joy. So we look back here at Exodus 17. There's no water for the people to drink, and what do they do? They complain. They're walking in obedience, but they complain. Therefore, the people contended. The word contended in Hebrew literally means blamed. So therefore, they blamed Moses, and they say, hey, give us water that we may drink. It doesn't say it, but you've got to wonder, Moses, we saw what you did at the Red Sea. Come on now. You part of that water, give us some water to drink. We're out here in the desert. There, it's a command, give us water. We're out here, we're dying, give us water. And Moses says, why do you contend? Why are you blaming me? Why are you tempting or testing the Lord? They're blaming Moses, but Moses is a called by God leader. And as they're blaming him, he sees it's not him. They're blaming him, but he sees their real issue is their issue with trusting God. Moses just happens to be the leader. And immature faith will blame the person that God is using to lead. And he sees it. So he doesn't get upset. He says, why are you contending with me? Why are you tempting, notice, the Lord? But it's so much easier to blame someone else than to take a step back and say, God, give me wisdom to see what I should learn in this. God, help me get my eye off of the problem. It's so much easier just to blame somebody. But help me get my eye off the issue onto you. God, what do you want me to learn here? God, I need you in this. This is a mess, God. If you don't step in, I'm going to die here. And that's where they're at. God, there's no water. We're too far in. If we, three days, we don't have enough water to even walk back out to where there was water. We're in trouble. Moses, give us something to drink. No, much better. Lord, we're walking obedience to you. This looks bad. Time for you to act. God, we're going to trust you. Not yet. They're not doing it. They blamed Moses and they did nothing to help the issue. All they could do was complain. Ever been in a group of folks like that? This is a problem. This is what they should do. This is what they should do. It's not. This is what they should do. The question is, God, what are you going to do? And God, what would you want me to do? It's not, this is what they should do. It's, God, what should I do? That's the issue. We're going to see that popping up in a second. So they're complaining to Moses. It says in verse 3, And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses. They're blaming and complaining. And they said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children with our livestock with thirst? Notice Moses is done. He just turns to the Lord. Smart man. We saw that in James 1 there. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He'll give it to all liberally without reproach. That's what he's doing. He cries out to the Lord here. And he says, he cries out to the Lord saying, what shall I do? I love that with this people, but I love what shall I do? When we're in a trial, when we're in a difficult time, there's the answer. Realize, first off, am I walking in obedience to the Lord? Is this a consequence of sin or am I walking in obedience? If I'm walking in obedience, the next step in is to cry out, Lord, what should I do? Lord, I'm walking with you, and this is a bad situation. 
what should I do? Don't try and fix it. Don't blame somebody else. Lord, I'm walking in obedience to you. What do I do here? What do I do with this people? He is freaking out, shall we say. It's interesting for Moses. We find in Moses a man who is leading, but he's leading under the pressure of an unfair attack by the people he's supposed to be leading. So he's leading people, and they are making false accusations against him. And they're blaming him for following the Lord. Interesting spot Moses finds himself in. So he cries out to the Lord, what should I do? They are almost ready to stone me. Well, that's not good. They're, they're, they're going to kill me out here. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people. So I put that as the third point. When we're in difficult times, it can happen in times of obedience. Cry out to the Lord for wisdom. And he says, go on before the people. Don't stop. Keep going. And take with you some of the elders of Israel. Not all the elders. Some of the elders of Israel. I just put that together and said, don't go it alone. Don't want to be a Lone Ranger Christian. I know every one of us feel we're the smartest thing since sliced bread. Best thing since sliced bread. Smartest person on the planet. I know we all are. We get that. Don't do that. Don't go it alone. Don't go it alone. So it can happen in times of obedience, difficult times. Cry out to the Lord. As long as you're walking in obedience and it's difficult to God, what do you want me to do? And don't go it alone. And that's going to be the reoccurring theme in chapter 17 is we need other people around us. Don't go it alone. He says, take some of the elders of Israel with you. And then he goes on. He says, also take in your hand your rod. And you might want to circle that second your. Your rod with which you struck the river and go. Because we have Aaron's rod. We're going to see Aaron's rod is the rod that's going to bud later on in number 16, I believe it is. But this is Moses' rod. This is a rod in Exodus chapter 4, remember? When Moses says, well, what if they don't believe that I saw you? don't remember his excuses. And God says, what's that in your hand? He says, this is my rod. He says, throw it on the ground. Remember what happened to it? Became a snake. A serpent. Remember Genesis 3. Became that. Also the symbol of Pharaoh, who is a type of Satan. So there it is. He says, now reach down and pick it up by the tail. He picked it up by the tail. Picked up a snake by the tail. He did that, and it became a rod in his hand again. That same rod in chapter 7, verse 17 of Exodus, God tells Moses, take the rod that's in your hand, the one that became a snake back there, take that, take your rod, strike the Nile River, and it became blood. So this rod that was in Moses' hand, he has seen the power of God as he's used that rod to demonstrate the power of God. Not only to demonstrate it, but as we look at it, it became a serpent, and he hit the Nile River with it, and it became blood, judging that first god of Egypt. The rod becomes an instrument that we see of judgment. First it becomes a sign of the fall, and then he strikes the river and it becomes blood. So this rod, as Moses would take the rod, he would remember, oh man, that's right, God's a powerful God, man. I know this rod, I have my rod, but I've seen God do crazy things with this rod. God is awesome. He wouldn't think about how much power he had. He didn't keep the rod like it was a good luck charm, like the Nehushtan stuff. But he remembered the power of God. And that's the first thing we see. God looks at him and he says, you know, take these elders with you and take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. So now he, he goes out. It's almost like saying, okay, you're going to go. Don't go it alone, but remember the power of God. Don't forget the power of God. It's not you, Moses. It's God. And oh, if we can learn that, if we can just learn it's God, it's not us, man, it's God. And he says, you know, take that and go. So he goes, and then the Lord says something pretty cool here. He says, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, another name. He says, but I will stand before you there on the rock. So God says, you go with these elders, you take that rod, we need water here at Rephidim. I've had a chance to be to this, uh, the traditional site 
of Mount Sinai. And the traditional spot of Rephidim, if it is correct, Rephidim is very close to Mount Sinai. Very close. You can see where it is. It's right there. But if it's there, if it's in Arabia, wherever it is, there's all kinds of people saying they move Mount Sinai around all over the place. But um, it takes a lot of faith to move mountains, but they're doing it. They're moving Sinai here. They're moving there. They're moving Sinai all over the place. But you can just move it around. But Rephidim is close to Mount Sinai. And we're going to keep in mind that they're in Rephidim. And God says, I'm going to go into Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai there. And he says, I'm going to stand before you. He says, so you go before the people. Take the elders with you. Take the rod in your hand. And I will stand before you there on, on the rock in Horeb. So I just kind of put up there, remember God's power. Also, remember God's presence. In the midst of difficult times, God is there. He's standing before you right there. So now we look at difficult times. It can happen in times of obedience. And with that as the case, we cry out to God for wisdom in seeing this from his perspective. God, what are you doing in my life? What am I to learn in this? God, I know I'm going to, be, I'm going to develop patience or endurance or hypomone in this. I know I'm going to become perfect and complete as I hang in this. God, help me not to doubt you. Help me not to doubt your power, not to doubt your presence in my life because we're going to see that's the mistake they make. God, help me not do that. Don't let me go it alone, God. Help me reach out and swallow my pride and say, I need a little help here. And he says, and I'll be there on the rock in Horeb with you, before you. And he says, and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. He says, you're going you're gonna to strike the rock. It's interesting. Remember in Isaiah 53, it talks about the Messiah and him being smitten. Same word, interestingly enough. So this rock is smitten or struck by Moses, by that rod. She says, you just strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. It is so interesting because as we look at this, there, there, there's, there's just so much. There's so much here. So we're going to take a step back, and we're going to start working our way through it, and then we're going to type it out because the typology in Exodus is amazing as we look at this. But the first thing, let's take a, a step back in verse 5 and 6. In 5, remember, he says, now go on before the people. Moses is leading two million people in the desert, no water. They're concerned. They've already been complaining quite a little bit in the last couple chapters. And now, here it is again, and what God tells him to do, he says, you go on before the people. Yep, this is a difficult situation. Moses, you're the leader. What do leaders do? They lead. Some of us have had experiences where we are in a position of a leadership, whatever it might be, an employer, a parent, a husband, whatever position we're in. And we're leading, and the people, you can only lead if people follow. If they don't follow, you're not a leader. I just, I'm sorry, you're not a leader. That's one of the trademarks of a leader. That's what makes a person a leader is people follow. He says, Moses, go on before the people. I've called you to lead. Yep, they're complaining. They want to kill you. But what do leaders do? They lead. Husbands, you have a wife that's in complete rebellion. Well, then forget about it. You can lead. I'm backing off. Wrong. You are called to lead. The children are in total rebellion. Well, fine, you want to do it, kids? You just do your own thing. I'm done. No, 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 no. Parents are to lead. We're to lead. That's what leaders do. They lead. When God is putting you in a position of leadership, lead. Just lead. They'll be accountable to God if they follow or not. But if God has called you to lead, lead. How can they follow if you're not leading? They can't. They can't. It's imperative that we lead. He goes on, he says, uh, take with you some of the elders of Israel. We already talked about that. Don't go it alone. Because you see, leadership is not dictatorship. My flesh wants to be dictator, of course. We all do. But that's not leadership. Leadership shares responsibility. Husbands do not dictate to the wife. They lead the wife. Big difference. Big difference. We lead without dictating. We have our wife praying with us. We, we listen to our, advice, our wife's counsel. 
Guys, you know, those of you that are married, you know. When a wife gives you counsel, if she's walking with the Lord and you're spending time with your wife and you're praying with your wife and you're washing in the word and she's growing, when God speaks to her, her heart is not to lead you. She loves you. And God will speak through her to you. It's okay. That's part of leadership to realize that's good counsel right there. We're going to do that. Now, if you do it once, you know, if they do it once, it doesn't mean, okay, I get to lead now. No, you don't. It means that God used you. Yay, that's good. He'll do that. Sometimes he'll use you. Sometimes he won't. And it's okay. You're a, you're a couple. You're a couple. Don't go it alone. Remember God's power. Remember God's presence. But we want to look at this last part. You shall strike the rock. The rock is an interesting thing. with the rock and that is I think I have it on here maybe I don't do I have it on that slide nope I don't okay we'll just talk about it the rock is an interesting phrase that is used throughout the Old Testament for God if we go to Deuteronomy we have time Deuteronomy 32 15 Deuteronomy 32 15 it says this speaking of the Lord in the song of Moses again the, the later song that he writes But Jeshurun grew fat and kick, speaking of Israel. You grew fat, you grew thick. You are obese, or obounds. Then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. So there we see a reference to God as the rock. If we go to 2 Samuel 22.2, 2 Samuel 22.2, it says there, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust. So we see God again being referred to as this rock, this, this place of strength, this place of stability, this place of durability, this place of elevation, this big old rock that weathers the storms, that is strong, this immovable God, the rock. And we see, remember, in 1 Corinthians, interestingly enough, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He says this in chapter 10. He says, Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware, chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians verse 1, that all our fathers were under the cloud. As they're going through the desert, God had them covered. They had it made in the shade, so to speak. But he had the cloud. They were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that spiritual rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual morality, as some of them did, and one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, because we see the mistakes they made in the wilderness, wilderness wanderings and all, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaken you except as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, flee from idolatry. Isn't that something? So he says, this Old Testament study that we're in is written for our example so that we don't blow it like we see the children of Israel blowing it. So we're in a hard time, a difficult time. Realize it doesn't mean that you're in disobedience. It might be if it's consequences of disobedience, but if we're walking with the Lord and something bad just hits us like, oh man, it's okay. Just cry out to the Lord. God, give me wisdom here. Don't go it alone. Remember his power. Remember his presence. But now as we look at this, God says, strike the rocks. 
smite this rock. Interesting, Paul says there's a spiritual rock that ties into this. And because of that, people look at this whole thing we've been looking at, the blood of the lamb going through the Red Sea. Then the bread from heaven coming down, and they say the bread from heaven, of course, the word of God. They say it's also a picture of Jesus himself when he says, I am the bread of life. And how interesting they say is it that the bread came down first in chapter 16, there's the incarnation, and now in chapter 17, this rock, which is Christ, 1 Corinthians, picture of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, is smitten. The same word used in Isaiah 53, talking about the, prophesying about the, the death of the Messiah, and how this rock is smitten here. But then what's interesting, okay, we've got the incarnation, we've got the crucifixion pictured here in the pages of Exodus, and then it says water will come out of it that the people may drink. What's really interesting, think about this. You're out in the desert, Moses, talk about a major act of faith in front of two million people that are murmuring about killing him. He's going to have to just have faith in God right now. So he goes up on that rock, he takes the rod, and he hits the rock. And it's crazy. You read about this, and different people say there probably was a deep spring in there that God brought water. Or maybe God just let water come out. Hello. But it doesn't make any difference how it happened. What happened is he struck the rock, the water came out. And this becomes a major event. In fact, later on in the Feast of Tabernacles, they have a special ceremony commemorating this event. How God provided water in the wilderness for millions of people out in the desert. So much so that on the last day of the feast, remember, they had a special thing where you'd go down every day for the Feast of Tabernacles. You'd go down one time to the Pool of Siloam. That's where Willie taught, remember, the Pool of Siloam rose. They would go down to that spot, and then they'd go up to the Temple Mount. One trip a day. But the last day, that eighth day, the great day, the ending day of the feast, they made multiple trips down there. It was a big ceremony commemorating the water out of the rock. Jesus was there, remember. And if we take a look at chapter 7 in John, we'll be covering it in a couple of months, but in John chapter 7, Jesus is there. And it says in verse 37, on the last day, John 7, 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, now this is the day they celebrate the water coming from the rock. This is it. God provide water from the rock. Here it is, what we just studied, this is the day they celebrate it. Jesus stands and he cries out. He doesn't whisper out. He, does, he cries out and he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, God brought water out of a hard rock. And now Jesus is saying, no matter how hard your heart is, you come to him, and he'll bring out rivers of living water out of what you once had a hard heart. And those of us can look back before we came to Christ. Remember your heart? And then you come to Christ. Something changes. And this water comes out. I wonder what this water could mean. Oh, John tells us. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, the water, a picture of the Spirit of God, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, so not yet, but it was going to come. Why not? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the water would not come out of the rock. The Spirit of God would not come to someone placing their faith in Jesus until the Lord was glorified. Once he's crucified and he goes, now the Spirit of God comes out. Look at the typology in chapter 17. How interesting the order. You will strike the rock. There's a picture of the crucifixion of Jesus. And then the next event, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. An interesting picture here all the way from placing our faith in the blood of Jesus coming through the Red Sea. 
having the bitter water made sweet because we look at the cross now that's always been there, but now we're aware of it. Having the bread of heaven coming down and feeding on that, and now the water coming out of the rock. It's, it's an amazing picture of the grace of God, the grace of God, the grace of God, the grace of God. People are complaining, people are complaining, and God just keeps blessing. Aren't you glad? Anybody complain here besides me about some of the events in our life? Any, do, I, do I have some complainers? Okay, the rest of you, you got any liars in the room? Okay, that covers all of us. Now we're good to go. Okay, here we are. But it's, it's, it's one of those things, you know. It's, we complain. And yet God blesses. Go figure. Don't you, don't you just love that? The grace of God is all over the book of Exodus. The key word for the book of Exodus, Genesis, remember, is beginnings. Exodus is redemption. It's all about redemption being played out in front of us, the redemption of God's people out of Egypt, but what a beautiful picture it is from the very beginning up until now already of God and how he redeems us through Christ. It's a, it's a, it's, ugh, Exodus is like stinking awesome. But anyway, any rate, here we are. It goes on in verse 6 at the end, and Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God says, do this. He does it. Go on before the people. Okay, bring the elders of Israel with you. Some of them. Okay. I'm going to be with you. Okay. Take that rod in your hand now and strike the rock and the water will come out. Okay. And he did so. So he called the name of the place Masa and Marabah. It means temptation or tempted and contention. So they were tempted or they tempted God, tested God, and they were busy content in contention with Moses, ultimately with God. So he called the name of the place that as a constant reminder that we didn't do so good here, huh? Because of the contention of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, and here's the issue, is the Lord among us or not? There's the issue. God, I gave my life to you, where are you? You ever said that? That's what they said. That's exactly what they said. The Lord told us, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Yet things get rough, and what do we do? God, where are you? Hmm. Other than that, it's pretty good. It goes on. Now we come to a portion of Scripture that we've covered many times, but I want to, I'm hoping to find some new things for me, and hopefully I can share some for you, because this is one of those passages here that of places in Scripture, just over the years, you pick certain ones that you use so someone ever calls you, especially in Santa Fe because Glorietta was a very active Bible conference center for a long time and people would go there a lot and then I'd get a call and my secretary would come in and say, can you do a, a men's retreat tonight at 7 o'clock? And I'd go, uh, yeah. So i just go out there. But you better have something ready. So I had these different teachings just kind of stocked, ready to go. This was one of them. I love this passage. But, um, God's word is so, so deep and so sweet, there's always more in it. So we're going to go a little bit deeper in this passage. There's just some fun stuff in here. A lot of the stuff you've heard before, the keys to victory are going to be things we've covered before. But I'm hoping that I can share some of the things that I really think the Lord showed me today that was just really fun. I said, God, I just want to learn new stuff. It says, some of the things you know. Now, Amalek, that's Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau? This is Esau's grandson we see from genealogies. So his grandson is out there. He came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now remember what was going on? The children of Israel were out in the desert with all these people. There was no water. Where was that? Rephidim. All of a sudden the Amalekites show up and they fight where? In Rephidim. I wonder if it had something to do with the water. There's water there. We're here. We want water. You guys got to go. So they start picking off, remember, the stragglers. We saw in Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy 25 talks about that. The weak, the old, at the end of the line. They start picking them off. Easy pickings and all. But I find it so interesting that it's the Amalekites who attack Israel. It's not Israel who attacks the Amalekites. And in light of the picture of typology, remember what's going on here now. We see them placing their faith in the blood of the Lamb. They are now set free from certain demise. They've come through the Red Sea, a picture of resurrection, of not having this death sentence that was passed on them. And then all of a sudden, the bitter waters become sweet. And then bread from heaven comes down on them, the Word of God in Jesus himself, you know. And then all of a sudden, 
no water and they complain. And then God in his grace gives them water from the rock, the Holy Spirit right there come flowing out of them. Then Amalek attacks. In uh, Galatians 5, I think it's 17, it says the flesh warreth against the spirit. Not the spirit against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. Interesting. Because Amalek in scripture is a type of the flesh. So now we see Amalek attacking the children of Israel. Just as Galatians 5.17 says, we have the same battle today. But do you, as we look at our own lives, in fact, I was talking to someone today, I forget who I was talking to, and I was talking about my childhood. And I think it was like 15 or 16 when you guys started to trust me on the weekends. If you guys went somewhere, I could stay home by myself. It was like, when Christy was 15, 16, she didn't get to stay home by herself. Cause I know. But anyway, thank you for that. That was awesome. And um, my, a real good friend of mine, Steve, he's coming, by the way, day after tomorrow. He'll be here for a while. But he would come in. We'd hang out at my place. And then we'd invite the rest of the guys. But it was a small town, and we were all into sports and that. So there wasn't drinking. There wasn't drugs. There wasn't sex. What there was was poker. A lot of cards. We just played cards all the time. That's what we did. So we just played cards. And I was talking to this guy. I forget who I was talking to somebody. And I was just saying, yeah, it was crazy. He says, did you do that? I said, no, we didn't do that. We just played cards, a lot of cards. For money? So of course for money. Dime a game, nickel a set. <laughs> if you played poker, nickel maximum. Man, we, we didn't have a lot of money. Are you kidding me? Come on. We just had to play with what we got. But yeah, we played for money. We did that. And they said, well, did your parents get upset? I said, no, they didn't care. They knew we were playing cards. They don't care. It's not a big thing. I said, I wasn't saved then. I didn't feel guilty. I didn't know to feel guilty until after I got saved. Once I got saved, then I felt guilty, but before that, I wasn't guilty. I just would have lived my life. And that's exactly what happens, isn't it? When you come to Christ and the Spirit of God floods you, all of a sudden, my flesh, that old nature, starts to war against me a little bit. And that's what we see here. That all of a sudden, there's this battle as the flesh now starts to go against that new nature. The old nature, new nature, don't coexist well. And there's this battle, and that's what we see here. Now, Amalek came and fought with Israel where? In Rephidim, the place where the water was given. After the water was given. Where did it happen? Rephidim. When did it happen? After the water was given. That picture of the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. And we said, there is the first step to having victory in your battle with the flesh, whatever it might be. It can be anything from lust to immorality to anger to drugs to booze to gossip. You pick your sin, whatever it is. We all have a different Amalek. We have a different king in our life, whatever it is. But the first step in having victory over it is we have to understand we have to fight it. It does not work to say, well, I was just born this way. Now we're justifying our old nature. I wish my sin was a disease, because then I could blame God. God, you made me this way. But the Bible makes it very clear that it's not a disease. It's a choice we're making. It's our king. We're hanging on to it. And we're making a choice. Jesus or the king of my flesh, and that's the battle. That's the battle. So the first step is we have to enter into the fight. If we have the backbone to enter into the fight, most people do not. They don't want to fight the king of their flesh. They enjoy his reign. Choose us some men, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with that rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek. Step one, enter into the fight. Now it's interesting the Am Amalekites launch an unprovoked attack against Israel in a very despicable way. And Moses says, we've got to fight this. We've got to fight it. And then notice, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, does anybody, is anybody sitting in here right now and you don't know what I'm going to do with three people? Does anybody not know? Put your hands up if you don't know. I don't know what you're going to do. Come up here. You'll be one of the three. Come on. <laughs> anybody else not know? Bob, do you know? 
You know what I'm going to do? You know? Get up here, Bob. Come here. Okay, come up here. I need one more. Juanito, do you know what I'm going to do? Get up here, Juanito. Come up here, my friend. Come on, buddy. Okay, Matt, it's going to be you, okay? You're the first one. So you're going to be Moses for us. Come on, come on up here, man. Never mind, Juanito. Have a seat. Have a seat. Because it said Moses, Aaron, and her, right? So it should be a woman. It's a her. I can't use a husband and wife. That's not Yeah, I can. Come up here, Melissa. Come here. Come here, Melissa. So you're going to be her, okay? But really, her's a guy, but on this side over here. So notice what it says right now. They're up here, and Moses is going to the top of the hill. And he says, Joshua, you go fight. And while you're fighting... He says, so it was in verse 11, when Moses held up his hands, right there, when Moses took that position, Israel was winning. was winning. And they were not dying. Think about that. You put your hands up, and your family and your friends don't die. But now you put them down, Losing. and they die. Can you imagine you're looking, and, and there's your favorite uncle. Your hands are down, and you watch them get slaughtered right in front of you. What do you think you might do? Probably put your hands back up there, yeah. Get them up there high, because you want them up there. So that's, his hands are up, people live. His hands are down, people die. Put them up. That's the Hebrew prayer position. What a picture this is. You're going into battle against the flesh, Joshua is going to battle. He's going to use his, the sword to destroy the Amalekites. He fights all day long. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that he gets tired. Moses gets tired. And I think sometimes we forget the importance of prayer. And that real prayer is very tiring. It is work if we're really going to pray. Now, if we're going to pray a quick prayer before meal, of course, and we'll get real spiritual, we'll pray for like, Two minutes. We're going for it. And then you're praying away the two minute prayer, and your wife kicks you under the table, like, come on, the food's getting cold. Okay, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Moses prayed all day long. And when he stopped, people died. So Moses' prayer was literally a life and death issue. And the question is, even today, Praying is a life and death issue. Amen. Eternal life and oftentimes physical life. But yet we do everything but pray. We study about prayer. We read about prayer. We talk about prayer. We promise, I'll pray for you. And then we forget and you see him. Thanks for praying for me. I'm so much better now. And it's like, oops, I forgot. And then it, the enemy gets, see, so prayer doesn't make that much difference after all, does it? No. It's up, 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 up. Life and death matter. <laughs> So Moses is up here praying. Is it getting sore in the, in the shoulders a little bit? Yeah, it does. Because it's, it's, it's hard. But listen to this, Matt. Just listen to this. Listen to this, Matt. You'll like this. Ready? So it says up there, and Moses held up his hand. When it happened, Israel prevailed. We let him down. Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. Does that make sense to you? you? I bet it does, man. Let's help you out. Just keep him up. We want nobody dying here. Step forward a little bit. Her, stay right there. And they, Aaron and Moses, Aaron and her, help out their brother-in-law. Remember, her was Miriam's husband. Aaron was Miriam's younger brother. And Moses was their baby brother. So you guys are going to do is you're going to help Moses keep his hands up or you're going to have him sit down on, the, on a stone. So help Moses sit down. You've got to keep those hands up. Just keep looking at the battle because we want nobody dying, none. So set him down. And it says that Moses and her help support his hands. So Aaron, Aaron and her. So lift up his hands a little bit. Just rest your arm. Doesn't that feel much better? Yeah. <laughs> much better? Yeah. It looks about the same, doesn't it? Yeah. But th these muscles relax. You feel them cramping on you? 
Yeah, that's tough right there. Oh, man. <laughs> Stay right there. Stay right there. So the hands are still up, and people are still not dying. Isn't that something? So notice what it says. Moses' hands became heavy. They took a stone, put it under him. He sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Matt, think all day long holding your hands up without them helping you. That would be killer city, man. Can you imagine? Think about that, though, guys. Think about that. You look at your kids. You look at your family members. You look at all these people that you love, and your hands, your shoulders are aching. But you know if you put them down, you die. They die. How thankful are you for Aaron and her right now? Yeah, this, this, is called, this is called prayer support. Isn't that something? People praying alongside of you. Don't go it alone. Don't go it alone. We need help. We get tired when we try to do it ourselves. We get discouraged when we try and do it ourselves. We give up when we try and do it ourselves. But when we have prayer support, when you feel like giving up, you've got these people right here with you. Do you see how important prayer support is? Really important in our spiritual battles for our children, for our marriages, for what God has for us. When we're in the midst of troubles, when we're battling ourself, our own old nature and our flesh, it's so important to have an Aaron and a her that you can go to and say, I need support in this. Now, my flesh, especially in the position that God has me in right now, my flesh loves being prayer support because then you're going to come to me and tell me all your stuff. And I'll take it to the men's prayer meeting and tell them to pray for all your stuff. And this just makes me feel good because you got stuff and it implies that I don't have stuff. That's not what prayer support is. We don't have to give details to our errands and our hers. It's not my business or anybody else's business. Well, tell me what you're really going through so I can pray for you. That is baloney. No, you're going through something? I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you. God, you know. God, I'm going to pray for my brother. I'm going to pray for my sister because they're going through stuff right now. And God, just come alongside of them. God, let them feel your love. Let them feel your power. Let them be aware of your presence. Things we talked about. But I don't need to know what it is that Matt needs prayer for so that I can pray for him. God knows. I'm just there to support him and to pray for him. You get the picture. One of my favorite things I, re I read or heard, I don't remember what it was. It was so many years ago. It was probably 40 years ago. Long time ago. But it's one of those things I never forgot. It was just one of those things like, oh, man, that's horrible. But it was talking about a guy that went into a prayer meeting, kind of a new believer. And he heard about, you know, confessing your sin one to another so you can pray for one another and all this. And he goes, oh, man. And you just pick your sin, whatever your sin might be, because it's not important what the sin was, but it was a down and dirty sin. And he says, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And there's a small group of six people at this prayer meeting. And he says, guys, this is what I'm doing. And he just puts it out there. And people start flushing, getting embarrassed and uneasy. And he just keeps talking. It's like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And he gets done finally. And he says, that's my sin. And the next guy says, well, my sin is, and they named his sin. Maybe it was, yeah, I don't know if it's a sin or not, but I'm, I've got this going on in my life. And I got this in my life. We'll pray for you, brother. We'll pray for you. Goes around each one. And the last guy, he says, well, my sin is, I have the sin of gossip. And I can hardly wait to get this prayer meeting over. I got lots to talk about tonight, man. And off you go. Don't be that guy. Don't share with other people what you hear at a prayer meeting or a prayer request. And when you share a prayer request, don't get into detail. Just say, I'm struggling in an area. I need some prayer. Please help me. But I would encourage you to find a couple of people that you can just call up and say, I need prayer. Oh, what's it about, brother? Let me tell you. And you start talking. No, don't, don't do that. You got it. Hang up and pray. Or pray with them. Hang up and pray some more. But don't get into details. My flesh wants your details. And you know your flesh wants the details. Really? You got that? Ooh, that's pretty bad. I better pray more. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just stay quiet and get the prayer and go. Matt, how are those arms feeling better? 
Are, are they hurting? Yeah. Are you holding them up? Yeah. Don't hold them up, guys. Hold them up for them. Here, bend it like that and hold it right underneath there. Bend that one there so Bob can just hold your hand up. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, good. Because you still got 20 minutes, buddy, so we can't. <laughs> we got to be careful here. But, so we got this prayer support. <laughs> Melissa, how, is it hard for you to hold his hand up? No. Not at all, Bob. Not at all. So prayer support, you're going to help the guy who needs it or the one who needs it, and you can do that all day long. And that's what they did with Moses. You see how that works? Okay, thanks, guys. We're good. Whew. Thank you, Matt. Amen. Thank you, big guy. That was awesome. <laughs> Snap. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, Melissa, please rub those shoulders for him tonight. He's seriously going to need that. Give him some good rub down on there because whoo those babies are burning. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. That was awesome. So we look at this, and there, he's there, and they were steady till going down the sun. Verse 13, so Joshua defeated Amalek. Notice the word so in verse 13. Why did he defeat him? Because of one man praying. Isn't that something? One man praying determined the outcome of that, that battle. Do you realize that one person praying in your sphere can determine the outcome of the spiritual battles that are going on in your family, your friends at work? One person. You be that person. Tell us about praying a lot. If you, if you see fruit in your family by doing that. Real close. Oh. Okay. Praying a lot. Pray, I mean praying for somebody. Praying fervently over a husband that doesn't know the Lord while he's sleeping with your hands held to the Lord, begging for his soul, pays off. How many years did you pray for your husband? Off and on, how many years? Fifteen. Fifteen years. No. Fervently for three. For like just. Oh. We have children now that we pray for. That's awesome. So, Clustin, you were the product of those prayers. Yeah. What do you feel about that? I'm thankful. I mean, I know she even had other family members praying with her that I didn't know about. So. And you're thankful. Yeah. So you hear that. Those of us that were praying for family members and friends who don't know the Lord yet, and oh man, there's the product of it. Three, I'm coming up on four years now? Yeah. Coming up on four years, and you're thankful. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. That's even better than thankful. That's thankful and amazing are both good. So you wonder how many people were so close and then the arms just went down. And you wonder how many people the arms stayed up. And how many people right now are we even entering into the battle? And are we willing to stand and pray for family members? Not so that they like us, but so that they live forever in the presence of God. So they don't go to hell. I mean, that's the issue. It's all about prayer. And that's what this is showing. Don't go it alone. Bring in your prayer support and pray. And pray. I wonder how many ministries struggle because of a lack of prayer. I found in my own life it's so much easier, so much easier to go street witnessing. When I was in San Francisco, every Saturday, we street witness about three to four hours. So much easier to street witness and pass out tracts and talk to people about Jesus than to pray for four hours. It's so much easier to study the word for hours on end than to pray for hours on end. <coughs> you start to pray, and your mind starts to wander. You start to think about this. You start to think about that. You wake up. Praying isn't easy. Praying is the hardest. And it's the most important. Moses wasn't done with the sword. He was praying. 
And it says, so Joshua defeated Amalek. And my understanding of, limited understanding of the Hebrew language, it's, it's a dependent clause on because of what Moses did. Because of what Moses did, Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And I find that so interesting. Keys to victory. Enter into the fight, prayer, and with the edge of the sword. Remember in Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God? Remember there's only one offensive weapon? It's the sword of the Spirit. Everything else is defensive. One offensive weapon, the sword of the Spirit. I, I, I don't know what that is. Wait a minute. The Bible tells us what it is. It says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So how, what are the keys to victory? Enter into the fight, prayer and prayer support, and the Word of God. And those three things equip us to have victory in our fight, our battle with our flesh. So when we're fighting our flesh, those are the three areas we want to hang on to and make certain that we use them or do them and use them. But it's interesting because this really changes the course of history, this battle right here. If the Amalekites would have won this battle, history would have been changed. This was actually, like we said before, a life and death matter, and it changed history. Do you realize one man's prayer changed history? Do you realize your prayer can change history? Amen. Now, this is, has nothing to do with me, guys. 100% guaranteed. Guaranteed. But in 1987, I started just teaching in a little Bible study, real small little Bibles. I did not have a clue what I was doing. I didn't pretend that I did. I just didn't know. So I went up there and taught. And after a while, they started calling me pastor. And it freaked me out because I was a funeral director. And when you're a funeral director and they call you a pastor, I, I honestly thought, this might be a ticket to hell right here. I'm not a pastor. What's wrong with you people? I'm a funeral director. I'd rebuke them. Don't call me pastor. I'm a funeral director, you know. And then the study just slowly started to grow over time, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, started to grow. And then all of a sudden, the opportunity came for me to move up to Santa Fe. And it was like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm here. We got this little building. It's sort of like when we took over this first unit here. We just had that little building. There I am. I don't know what to do. I'm not working all of a sudden. I'm just there. And you can only clean for so long. It was like at sunset, Dad, when you just you clean the funeral. Once it's clean, it's clean. It's like, okay, it's clean. Now what? Well, the church was clean and there weren't that many people coming. So it's like, well. Maybe I'll pray. So I went up to the front to this little platform like this. And I just knelt there and I would start to pray. And I would pray. I'd pray for Santa Fe. I would pray for everybody in that church, all, you know, 35 of them, whatever. I prayed for all of them and pray for them. And I'd pray just for oh, whatever I could think of, just praying and praying. And I'd look at my watch and 10 minutes. Are you kidding me? 10 minutes. Okay, so I'd pray some more. And I'm just praying for the, oh, God, just do something awesome here. And I'm just praying and just praying and praying. And then all of a sudden the door opened up, the front door. And a guy, and I'm thinking, really? I'm praying here. And my prayer was, God, grow. You know, dream, bring people in, God. This is such a small little church, but God, we're teaching. Lord, I just want to see you honored and glorified. Just do something. And someone opens the door. I thought, really? I'm praying here for the church to grow, and now someone's coming in here on the middle of the week. So I'm complaining, because I'm complaining. I try to look, and it's a guy I never met before, a young guy. Young guy, maybe 25 years old or something. Right? He just walked in. I'll never forget this. He says, is this a church? We get that here sometime. Remember, Roman? <laughs> is this a church? And, they, and I said, yeah, it is. Well, who are you? And he, I was young. I was like 31, I think I was, or 32. And I said, well, my name's Khan. Well, you're the pastor? I said, I am. Well, I don't know why I'm here. And I'm thinking, I don't know why you're here either. I was busy praying for God to grow the church, and you're standing here bugging me right now. But... <laughs> I said, what can I help you with? He says, well, my name's Brad, and um, my wife and I got in a big fight, big fight. And I was driving down Cerritos, and I was going to go out to the Villa and Mall. I, don't, I just turned on, I don't know why I turned. I just turned on to Fifth Street. I don't even know why. And I'm driving, and I looked, and I go, there's those chili peppers out there. I go, what is this? 
I think it's a chapel. This must be a church. So I just pulled in, and here I am. So I go, okay, well, good. Let's talk. So we sat down and talked. His name was Brad Dietz. His wife's name Mary. And I had a chance just to pray with Brad, and he received the Lord. Amen. That Sunday, he brought his wife. Then they brought their family. And then their friends. And I go, wow, I just prayed. I like that. I just prayed. I didn't have to go out and knock on doors. I didn't have to go out and try and convince people to come. I just prayed and let God bring them in. It was the most amazing thing. most amazing thing. And I cannot encourage you enough, guys. We all have family that we want to see saved. The most important thing you can do is not invite them to church. The most important thing you can do is pray for real and have other people pray with you and watch what God will do. That's the key. It's not about trying to talk someone into coming to Christ. It's about praying for them and letting God bring the victory. So in Exodus chapter 17, we really see it laid out there for us. It's, man. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Not yet, but he will. And Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now these are these crazy Amal Am Amalekites. Esau's grandson. And they go on through and, man, they're, they're just always causing a problem. Well, eventually the children of Israel get into the promised land under Joshua. And then for 400 years, they're in the promised land from Joshua and all through the period of Judges and everything. Samuel comes on the scene and they have a king. Remember the people, we need a king like the other nations, so they get their king. And it's Saul, not from the tribe of Judah, but from the tribe of Benjamin, but it's Saul. Big dude. Said he's a head taller than everybody else in Israel. He just seems like he's stately. He just got the look of a king. Everything on the outside says king. Everything on the inside says loser. But he's, he looks like a king. So the people want him to be their king, Saul. And Samuel comes to him and he says, you know, um, remember God said about the Amalekites, you've got to take them out. You've got to destroy all of them. Just destroy them. I got it. I'm going to do this thing. So he goes and he's going to kill all the Amalekites for Samuel 15. Samuel comes back to see how it's going. How did, how did it go? And where's Saul? He's over here celebrating over here a little bit. So they go there and there's Saul. And Samuel comes up to him. Well, I'm paraphrasing now. How did it go? He says, it was great, man. We did everything you told us to do. Everything you told us to do, everything you, the, the Lord your God, he says, told us to do, we did it. We killed all, you know, basically saying we killed all the people, killed all the animals, killed all the women. Killed, we got rid of all the Amalekites because all the flesh has got to go, remember. And right as he's talking, remember what he hears? Yeah, a little sheep in the background. And he goes, wait a minute, if you killed all their sheep, what's this bleating I hear back over there? And Saul said, well, you know the people, you know, they kept some from the best. We kept the best alive. So we could sacrifice them eventually to the Lord your God, you know. It's, in other words, We'll tithe. That's what they're saying. He's saying, basically, we'll give the best to the Lord your God. Is it okay for me to go and gamble away my paycheck? If I win, I'll tithe. If you win gambling, don't tithe here. If you're going to risk your family's sustenance so you might win and you're going to try and justify it, we'll tithe off that. Don't tithe off that. Just spend it on your own stinking selfish self. It's all right. Don't worry about it. God doesn't need that. But at any rate, sorry, I got off on that. But anyway, here we are. So, what's this sound that I hear? Saul. And then Samuel says something amazing. He says, God wants obedience, not your sacrifice. God wants you to obey. It's not what you can do or give to God. He just wants you to obey him. And if we obey him, life's good. Everything's good. Just walk in obedience to the Lord, you know. So, 
Saul's not happy. You can read the, all the details about it. He says, well, don't leave me. You know, worship with me. Make me look good and all this stuff. But the interesting thing in there for me was Saul kept king of the Amalekites alive. He killed a bunch of the Amalekites, but he kept the best of their sheep and the king of the Amalekites he kept alive. So Samuel says, bring him out here. And it says the king of the Amalekites came out all conceited like he thought for sure, I'm not going to die. He comes checking out, probably had his chin up, you know. And there he is. Samuel takes one thing, the only thing that can kill an Amalekite. He takes the sword. Remember Hebrews 4, 12, that's the word of God, sharper than a two-edged sword. Remember Ephesians 6, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Samuel takes the sword and it says, he hacks him to pieces. Just slices him up the way Pastor Anthony would have with a, with, a, with a knife. I mean, he would slice that baby up. And that's the end of it. He killed the king of the Amalekites. That's always the hardest thing, is it not to kill the king of our flesh? I came to Christ in 75 at a fraternity. And since 1975, March 25th, I have not done coke. I have not done heroin. I have not done any drugs at all. Amen. And it was really easy for me because, you know, I didn't do any of those things before I was saved. <laughs> so for me to say, well, I'm saved. I'm not going to do drugs anymore. That wasn't the king of my flesh because I was... No big deal. I never did them. So I just have never done them. So that wasn't a big thing for me. I had other things that were big things for me. And I had the king of my flesh. So I still get to battle the king of my flesh. And we all have the king of our flesh. But it's different for every one of us. You know what the king of your flesh is. The one that's got to go. The one you got to take the sword and cut it up right now and stop it. You know what that one is? It's what you're thinking of right now saying he better not say that. If he says that... I'm out of here. Oh, there's your king. There's your king. Are you willing to enter into battle with the king of the Amalekites in your life? Whatever that is, are you willing to do it? And if you're not, just tell God, God, I like my king of the Amalekites better than you. I'm sorry, God. It's just what it is. I'm not going to fight it because I get a bigger thrill out of that than I do you, God. So, you know, that's just what I'm going to do. That's just what it is. And just, just be honest. I mean, he already knows that's what you're telling him, but at least if you say it, it might at least take the pressure off you. But it's so important that we battle the king of the Amalekites. Well, Saul didn't. He didn't kill all the Amalekites. And sure enough, we get to the end of chapter, or of uh, First Samuel, remember our First Samuel study, chapter 31 of First Samuel? Saul is up on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines have got him, his sons. And Saul sees, I'm losing the battle, and he knows he's toast. He goes to his armor bearer and says, just kill me, man. And the guy says, I'm not going to kill him. No. So Saul takes his own sword, it says, and he falls on it, and he kills himself. That's what it says in chapter 31 of 1 Samuel. Then we go to 2 Samuel, chapter 1, and we, the scene shifts to the camp of David. And David's there wondering how the battle's going with Saul and his Jonathan, his buddy, and the, Jonathan's brothers and that. And all of a sudden, this guy comes into camp running. He's just all tired. And he's all, Phew. And he said, David. He said, yeah. Have you come from, I came from the battle. What happened? Oh, man, Saul's dead. His sons are dead. Are you sure? Yeah, I, I know for sure because I came across Saul and he was wounded. And he asked me to, to get, so I, I killed him. And I got, his, I, got, I got his crown right here. See, there's Saul's crown waiting to get the reward because Saul was your enemy, right, David? And I took care of him. So we have two accounts of the same event. First Samuel, it says Saul fell on his own sword. Second Samuel 1 says that this man came running in, killed Saul, and stole his crown after he died. David said, so who are you? Remember what he says? I'm an Amalekite. So now we have a decision. Do we believe the word of God in 1 Samuel 31 or do we believe the word of an Amalekite in 2 Samuel chapter 1? Your choice. But I find it interesting that the crown, Saul's crown, was taken from him after he died by an Amalekite because he did not put to death the Amalekite, which is a type of the flesh, when he had the opportunity. I'm not saying salvation. I am saying the Bema seat 
with the rewards. That if we don't kill our flesh, you know, we can just spend our life doing inconsequential things while our family and friends are going to hell. But they, but they like us. So, this crown. In James it says, if we resist that temptation, we'll receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So it's just a matter of, do you want the crown? Or do you want the king of your flesh? Do you want to be used by God to reach your family members and your friends? Or is appeasing our flesh more important? Have a great week. God bless you. <laughs> so, Lord, thank you so much just for a time to walk through the word here. God, we ask that you would... Uh, God, give us a heart to truly pray for our friends, our family, to stop playing with such a serious issue. But God, to truly pray with passion, to really pray with commitment, as we even heard a testimony from Clesson and Rhonda, God, where you pray for your mate if necessary when they're sleeping, whatever it is, God, and not to give up year after year. And I'm sure hands got tired, I'm sure hands went down, but they always went back up. And God, I thank you for a wife who prayed. And I thank you for a husband who responded to your call. And God, I pray that, God, you put on our own hearts that we would pray for the salvation of our friends and our family for real, seeing this a life and death issue. And we saw what one person's prayer can do. God, let us be that one person in our sphere of influence. God, to set aside the things that we justify in our life. And God, now as we look at our king, our king of the Amalekite in our own life, Lord, whatever it might be, God, there might be some of us who are saying, Lord, we're ready to put him to death tonight. We're ready, God, to, to get him out of our life tonight. To stop looking for a pass. But Lord, to truly um, spend our time wisely praying for the salvation of people who need to be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.